it's a difficult week for our guys. Uh, with finals and everything going on, we actually got in five practices before finals week started up. So uh, I was excited about that. But this week we'll uh, take the day off. We'll practice on Tuesday, Wednesday, take Thursday off, and then we'll practice some real intense practice on Friday. Uh, give them actually Christmas Eve and Christmas Day off on the 24th, 25th. Uh, and then we'll come over and condition a little bit before we head to L.A. on Monday. Um, very excited with the way they've kind of approached uh, uh, the Oregon prep to this point, you know, locking in. Uh, a lot of guys I know I've read from some of your comments or things I've read in the uh, uh, media about our guys just kind of focusing in. Last year was a nice trip, took advantage of it, but uh, this year they want to go out and finish things off better than we did a year ago. So uh, excited about that. Um, you know, with a second trip coming back to back, um, you can try to change up a few things that uh, maybe we did from a year ago, not only practice-wise, but also uh, some of the stuff we did away from the field. Bottom line, it's a great trip for the kids. We're staying at a great hotel. Um, get a lot of neat opportunities that come about just from being able to be in L.A. So uh, try to maximize that for the kids as well and, and hopefully move forward. Injury-wise, uh, Pete hasn't practiced with us yet to this date. Uh, uh, hopefully going to get him involved in our preparation out there, uh, if not sooner. Uh, otherwise, everybody else um, is back in full full. Uh, competition and, and other than the guys who are, who are medically moving on without uh, you know the, the surgery guys the, over the course of the season everybody should be 100% full go for for the game so with that open up for uh, questions right, you guys did a nice job on third down last year with uh, Tozin at quarterback but your numbers are even better this year and I'm just curious how much of that can be attributed to what Russell's been able to do, both pre-snap and with his feet. Absolutely. I think uh, a key element for us is our preparation. First off, uh, I was, it was in a discussion the other day with Paul Christ, and we were talking about how much time he puts into making the decisions on what's going to be called, all the preparation. You know, anytime uh, you, you go into a game plan, you want to have great execution on all downs, but third down is the critical down and being able to have a plan. So I think the preparation has been outstanding from our coaches, then to put it into the game plan with the kids. Um, but as the case you saw several times this year, that maybe the answer wasn't there, and Russell just being able to a stay alive and get the ball thrown downfield, or b um, and being able to scramble for a first down has been very, very uh, positive for us, and obviously has a huge impact on the stats. Fred, I think you said Cons was seeking a second opinion. Did you find out anything new? It, it's actually this week. Um, Pete's. <laughs> I, I grabbed him yesterday. Congrats him. I saw that, that he got another All American honor. Um, from the uh, pro football uh, coach, pro football weekly or whatever, and uh, I said I, was, I always kind of just grab the guys' house finals. And he's got he's got four of them, um, so I mean he was pretty stressed about that stuff. So um, I think that he flies uh, Wednesday, be back Thursday afternoon, and didn't interrupt uh, his his uh, academic schedule. Jesse. Travis Frederick's obviously a, a really smart guy off the field, and I'm, I'm just wondering on the field, do you think that any of that stuff translated at all with a guy who's can you know, switch positions in the middle of the game, and obviously he's you know, played multiple Yeah, it, it does carry over. I think, you know, obviously uh, Travis, computer science, computer engineering is a pretty good double major. Um, and uh, I think it does carry over the field. He's, he's really got a grasp of what's going on around him all the time and uh, to be able to make the calls at the line of scrimmage. Uh, and it just being, being smart in the way he plays. You know, he's pretty conscientious and uh, not penalized. Uh, may have had one or two calls this year against him, but a pretty clean player. Brett, the guy he plays to, Ricky Wagner, a little different personality than Travis, obviously. And, and we were asking uh, Paul about those two, and he said, look, we didn't go into the season looking to replace Gabe and Moth. But I'm just curious what those two guys have given you, especially Ricky, the toughness he showed down yeah. in Illinois, missing, I think, two series. You know, uh, I, I couldn't, I think the transition for Ricky was probably the most difficult of all the guys. I, I really do think moving to that left side threw him off a little bit, um, just because Ricky's kind of a perfectionist. I brought Ricky in last week and sat him down just to make sure, um, you know, the NFL wasn't something that, you know, uh, sending in the paperwork and whatnot and just had a real good conversation with Ricky because he was starting to get beat up by agents and stuff. And, um, so we kind of put the game plan together to have an outstanding senior year, and I really think you'll see a big jump in his play from a year ago to going into next fall uh, because he is a meticulous, detailed guy. He's kind of a quiet kid, doesn't say a lot, and he played through an extreme amount of pain, I think, on several occasions this year. And, and battle through it was pretty impressive. Do you think time of possession is a key stat in this game, or because they're so productive without having the ball much, does that almost make it meaningless? You know, I, I talked to Chip, uh, I think it was three years ago, he had a position on his staff that was open for a GA, and I was uh, one of my uh, former players was trying to get the position. I was just kind of general conversation with Chip, and he was talking about how they, you know, he, he, how he'd be the worst defensive coordinator to work for because they, they 
go forward on fourth down so much, and, and obviously all the success they have in such a short amount of time. So it, it, for us, it's a factor. So and yes, to your question, Tom, it, it, you know we always want to uh, win the time of possession game. That's kind of our signature deal. Um, We've been up there one or two usually in the Big Ten ever since I've been here, so it's a big part of it. For us to win this game, we've got to play Wisconsin football, and that's a key element. Coming back to Ricky for a second, you said he was getting beat up by agents. I assume you meant contact and try to... Yeah, I'm sorry. Was his mindset... Not physically beat up. Yeah, was, it, was his mindset, <laughs> I'm not ready, or we'll have that conversation? Yeah, go um, you know, it, it, just there's a lot of... I learned this one through Moff uh, a couple years ago, because I asked Moff and Gabe if he wanted to fill the paperwork. Both of them said no. And then basically an agent intervened uh, with his father and, and really got John confused. I remember, I, I don't know if I told you, I think I had to kind of call the day after the Rose Bowl or, or the day after a game and Moffitt was going to come out. So I've really tried any of my juniors that even have had a limited amount of success, I'll just kind of be upfront and honest. Hey, is this something that you're actually thinking about? Because just little birdies have been in my ear that he'd possibly been contacted by uh, people and, and kind of weighing his options. And we just kind of sat down and he kind of came pretty straightforward with me. He's like, Coach, you know, I just want to make sure I wouldn't break any rules if these people have contacted me. And it's usually the bad, it's the guys that are street urchins, the guys that, you know, that are, um, you know, just trying to get into business, trying to get a break and try to get a big name kid from a good program um, to come out and, and go with him to try and collect money on the front end. So um, I think Ricky's just a real quiet kid. He's, he's got a plan in mind. And uh, I remember sitting in my office two years ago when I gave him a scholarship and he broke down. I mean, he's come a long way uh, from, from where he is today. I know this is before you were here, but I'm wondering maybe if in your conversation with Coach Alvarez you ever talked about that 93 Rose Bowl team. And it seems like since that point, I mean, that really kind of put Wisconsin football you know, up here, and it's, it's been pretty consistent ever, ever since. Do, do you get a sense at all that maybe that season was kind of a turning point just for Wisconsin football? Well, I, I think it changed. Wisconsin. I was at another school at the time, and I remember watching the Rose Bowl on the, uh, in the hotel room with my head coach who I was working for with Hayden Fry at the time. We were at another bowl game. And, um, you know, I, I saw, read through uh, Brian's press release, and the, and the numbers are ridiculous. I mean, we're, other than USC, we're the most uh, represented team in, in the country uh, to the Rose Bowl since the BCS. I think USC's got five. This is our fourth. Uh, uh, for us personally, I, I, I can't tell you, just in traveling over the last month with recruiting, since the really since the championship game, just for me personally, how many people come up, and I think we got a lot of fans across the country and say, hey, they love the way we play, the way our kids represent, uh, the way that we come across on a national exposure. So at, at, at my time being here, it's at an all-time high, and I think Coach would probably agree with you since since that point, it's, it's at an all-new high right now. Jim? Monty had mentioned treating this more like a business trip because last year he said they were kind of starstruck and um, maybe weren't as focused on the game. Obviously, you want them to have fun, go to the B-fold of Disneyland. What do, you, what do you tell them to kind of have them enjoy this experience but, but stay focused and keep it like a business uh, trip? Pretty much. Uh, be up front. I think that's the part that I've uh, enjoyed as a head coach is, you know, my kids are pretty mature. They're pretty, you know, they handle everything for what it is. So I just kind of, you know, explain to them, hey, we're going to do some things uh, out there that are meant to be rewards for you. I'm taking them to a Lakers-Knicks game. That's like, I, I thought I was going to get a standing ovation for that one. Uh, but it's only a certain amount of guys get to go, you know. And there'll be little things that we get to do that are rewards for them. I'm going to modify and adjust our, our uniforms a little bit, and I think that'll be something that they get excited about that we'll reveal to them. So those are the neat things, those are rewards, but when it comes time to work, I need you to work. Um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll let them do certain things, but when we show up, I think Monty's taking the lead on that overall, uh, I think the whole season, and this will be no change. Okay. Brad, you mentioned, I think, last Wednesday when you met with us that you thought Nick, you'd be surprised if Nick didn't have one of his best games. I'm curious why you would think that, and also because his dad played here, you know, it was a long time ago. Do you think, in the eyes of some, he's measured to it, but he said, held to a different standard because of the success of dad? Yeah, I would think so. Um, and, and Nick, you know, like I've said all along, he wanted to come to Wisconsin. Obviously, he knew his dad's heritage and history here, but he wanted to make a name for himself, and I think he has done that and, and uh, played in a certain way that um, he plays well. I've always thought, going back to Nick's sophomore year, I remember that. That touchdown grab he had over the Michigan defender was kind of a circus catch. And I always thought Nick, uh, my first player that I really always thought that about was Travis Beckham. Travis always played big and big games. We preach about it all the time, but it's another thing to go out and do it. Uh, we have a couple of guys doing that now, I think, uh, and Nick's one of those guys. Can't let the uniform issue go by without a follow-up. Are, are you trying to match up with Oregon's No, uniform? no, I'm not, but I am not oblivious. You know, as a marketing major, for those of you that don't know it. Um, and I do realize that Oregon is a premier school for Nike, and they do... A lot of specific things, obviously, with Phil Knight and all that goes into 
being out there, but uh, it's a BCS Rose Bowl matchup between an Adidas school and a Nike school. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate everything Ni uh, Adidas has done for us here. And, and it's very kind of unique situation because you got Wisconsin who's red and white uh, on road uniforms and they, to incorporate a Rose theme in that type of uh, environment I think is going to be pretty cool. And uh, not everything's been finalized yet. i got to still give the final approval. And, and of course, the AD has to uh, approve of it. And we know he doesn't like change. I guarantee you we won't be wearing red pants. I know that. <laughs> uh, uh, anything else is kind of up for grabs. David? Coach, when we talked to Thomas Hammock, he used the word dedication to describe Brady. Is that a good word to use in, in just everything that he's put forth yeah. for this program? You know what it is. That's probably a, a great way to describe Brady. He is uh, very dedicated in everything he does, his preparation, the way he prepares his body. Uh, he's dedicated in his faith. Uh, you know, that's a very big thing, dedicated to his fiance. Uh, you know, he's just a... A, a great example of what a kid can, when he commits to something, about how much he can you know, have success doing, he really fully commits it, and that's what he's done. And he'll get rewarded, you know, I, 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 uh, the Packers were in here and they kind of were taking a specific look at him, I got a lot of questions, and I told Coach Hammock, I go, I don't know if I can tell Brady Ewing that the Packers were asking about him, because he might faint, uh, <laughs> you, you know, he's such a, I announced to the team yesterday that the Packers had lost, and you know, three quarters of my guys that devastated them the other quarter, you know, a lot of state guys are beat them up about it uh, left and right. So I can't believe there's that many Chiefs fans on our team, but it was kind of funny. Right. What do you think is the, the reason for the increase in turnover productivity by your defense? As, as the Big Ten play went along, and on the flip side of that, how important has it been for the offense not to let those turnovers be wasted? It, huge point. I, I think, Jeff, that might have been one of our biggest keys to success in some of those uh, uh, Games that weren't going, the Illinois game was critical to get the turnovers and to turn into scores. Um, but I, I think, A, it's emphasizing practice. I know we do a turnover circuit every day, and, and it's one thing to kind of say it or, or do it, but it's constantly talked about. They talk about, um, during a normal game week, we talk about Takeaway Tuesdays, where you're trying to put an emphasis on, on the whole day about tech, uh, creating turnovers. Uh, I thought our guys did a great job this year. If an opportunity was there, they maximized it. They didn't. There weren't a lot of picks that I remember that we got our hands on and were dropped. I mean, we, we caught the ball. Um, you know, the one that sticks out in my mind, I think it was Illinois, that I think Antonio hit it. One of their players might have hit it. It bounced off somebody else's head, and Aaron Henry came away with it. So, I mean, bottom line, the ball's got to bounce a little bit your way, but there was a huge point of emphasis with, with those guys in doing it. Dave, what have uh, NFL teams told you about Brady that, that they like so much that can get him to the next level? Well, I, I, did you ever think, I mean, him coming in here that this would even – be Brady's been a shocker the whole way through. Um, he came in, you know, we were going to play him at running back and, and uh, really did that for the first two years. And he, he got out of the field faster than I'd ever expected. And I remember him smiling that first touchdown. He came over to the sidelines and just grabbed me. Um, and, you know, then we decided to move him to full back. And uh, at first I think there was a little bit of, I don't know if I can do this type deal. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, I call him private pile. He came back hard and, uh, you know, from like the full metal jacket guy. He just, he turned into a little freak. Um, will get after anybody on any given play, no matter what type of block. I think the part that the NFL likes about him is, is Brady can stay on his feet and, and stay after people. He maybe isn't the most violent. The NFL is going to want to put 10 pounds on him. I mean, they're, that's what they're going to do. You know, he's at 235. They're going to want him at 245, which I think he can do. Um, but the, the part that about him that they really enjoy is, is, or, or appreciate, I think, his ability to stay on his feet and stay active on a block, and then also just the way he catches the ball. I mean, he's exceptionally gifted with his hands and then you know Brady is one of the few players on our team that starts in all four phases of the kicking game and is a vital player on those units so uh, I think those through those combination of things make it very very uh, exciting about the, the NFL. Fred, I think a lot of fans feel that this is a daunting task for your club against Oregon. You've watched them on film. How daunting of a task do you think this is? Well it's a task and um, you know I don't get degrees of, of difficulty but I mean you you have a Unique preparation. Uh, one one point of emphasis I've made to the kids is we got extended prep uh, for this game, which is, is critical. And you look at some of the games that they've uh, played with extended prep. You know, three years ago the Rose Bowl. This year, beginning of the year with LSU. Uh, last year at the end of the year in their bowl game. So um, there's several things that you can kind of draw from. That um, you know, it's good that we have these guys will be very hard to play within a week. Um, you know, if you got done with the game on Saturday and you had to get ready for them. I think it'd be a very uh, difficult challenge, but with the extended prep uh, and the opportunity to kind of slow the things down a little bit mentally, uh, is, is going to be great. But I, I get it. I think I, I appreciate and uh, uh, like the fact that a lot of people don't don't have a lot of confidence in what we're able to do. Yeah. 
Could you give us some perspective on their speed? I mean, it seems like you faced a fast team in the bowl every year. You know, are they significantly different, and where does it show up the most? I think offensive skill, they're exceptional. Um, everybody wants to talk about uh, the Michael James, but uh, any running back, number six for them, is, is, is incredibly gifted. Um, I think their skill overall on offense and defense is pretty good. Their, their corners are young, but they're very, very athletic. Their safeties are aggressive in the way they fill. Uh, I think their two edge players on defense are exceptional players. They play a lot of guys on defense, and then probably the area where it comes out the most is special teams. Um, for instance, uh, you know they, they don't punt the ball very often, but when they do punt, they've been very effective. And the punter's a good punter, but uh, they have great coverage guys. Brett, you mentioned doing some things differently as far as bowl prep when you compared this year's Rose Bowl to last year's Rose Bowl. And now you mentioned once they're out there doing some different things. Is there anything else um, that you can share as far yeah, as Yeah, um, one of the things that I've um, kind of taken the approach this year, we've um, normally we might get into like a 22 or 24 period practice. All practices this year will be 18 periods or less. I want short, shorter, crisper, faster uh, practices. And then we'll do one of the things I've never done as a head coach, my six years as a head coach, we've never done post practice conditioning. Um, but uh, and, and obviously we've had a lot of success, so I think the, fan, the plan works. But for this game, with, with maybe these shorter practices, we, we will emphasize conditioning at the end of practice uh, on, I believe, six of our, of our 14 practices to kind of simulate just the speed of the game and, and have to be in condition uh, uh, for that type of offense. Jeff, in your opinion, if, if Pete can't play in the bowl game, will that affect either his decision to return or to turn pro early, or how he will be perceived by the NFL. It, it definitely have a factor in it. Um, and what, what we're trying to do for Pete and, and for Monty, uh, all the guys in these type of situations, is gather as much information as we can, um, give them accurate information. What your part that, that gets difficult during these times is bad information. Um, the one thing the agents, uh, kids get enamored and wild, and, and you know, kind of when these agents start throwing out these dollar figures, and you got to understand and realize the one thing that an agent does once you hire them is he starts taking your money. Um, and they, they don't ever see it as that, that angle. It kind of takes a couple years for that to settle in. So uh, what we have to do is give them credible information from the people that are making the calls. You know, I've reached out to several GMs uh, uh, that I rely on heavily and, and to give real information. Uh, I believe this, this follow-up appointment or the second opinion, you know, obviously if there's some extended medical things, that's going to definitely affect uh, his status. And then a little bit, um, you know, when you start talking about first and second rounds, and even a little bit in the third, if you're a, a player in that, that draft status, you're not only for like Pete, he's not only competing against other centers, he's competing against like a Russell Wilson, uh, you know, next best player on the board uh, type situation for teams. Um, for a guy like Monty, you know, you got to look at teams that drafted player uh, running backs in the top two rounds the last year, they're probably not going to do that. And almost half the teams that they drafted players in the last two years uh, and that status. So it's it really, it's not a defined science, but it's kind of fun to work through. Andy, Ren, I don't know if you've gone back and looked at the, this particular history, but this is the second time you faced a Nick Aliotti defense mm -hmm. in a Rose Bowl. Have you gone back to when the, the first time that, that Wisconsin played uh, his defense? He, he was at UCLA, but has, I'm wondering if his, if his approach has changed at all significantly. You know, they're very um, uh, much more pressure oriented than they were probably. I went to the Oregon game two, uh, two years ago, I guess it was. Um, and they've really, this year, uh, now I've talked to actually three Pac-10 or Pac-12 uh, head coaches uh, about, because, you know, when you, um, when you play uh, a team in your league every year, you know, you get to know things better than a team that's going to watch them one time. But I think the thing about their defense, they, it kind of stays with their offense philosophy. They're very aggressive. They're very, very um, uh, speed oriented. They're moving a lot, uh, whether it be pressures or just just simple line movements, as well as linebackers. So, um, no, I haven't done a, a comparative study on their defense. We're kind of taking this year's plan and moving forward. Greg, you said this defensive staff makes the best adjustments of any defensive staff you've had. Could you expand on that, and can you think of any examples where that's happened this year? Yeah. Um, well, for instance, in, in I would say every of our first four opponents. Kind of the things we prepared for wasn't anything of what we came to see reality in front of us. Um, and then uh, during the course of the year, you know, for instance, the Purdue game, uh, they came out with a, a totally different plan than they really shown on film um, against us. Illinois as well. Uh, I thought the guys really did a nice job in in game. Uh, you know, I, I get a kick when I watch the sidelines. I see Huck sitting on that chair. He looks like a little professor in front of a small group of, of linebackers. And he, he just that teaching image uh, comes through on game day, but it's really good what I see during the course of the week to, to carry forward.
Because that could be confidence in a bowl game too, because you're always going to see something in a bowl game that you're not ready for. Right? Absolutely, um, especially Oregon's deal. Oregon will, you know, in during the course of the year, I always watch them in order. Uh, I like to go back to the first game and move forward. Um, some coaches try to watch cutups. I like to watch the entire games, and you see that they come out with, you know, maybe two, maybe three new formations every week, uh, and then have a certain group of plays within that uh, within that formation grouping that they feature every week, and every week is different. Brett, I, I think throughout the course of the year, it looks like Chris and Charlie, they like to stick with the base when they can. And against Oregon, that's, you know, that's a different animal mm -hmm. that you're facing. Has there been a philosophical discussion going on about how much we can get away with our base, or do we do we use our nickel? If you can some, can some, that one. Absolutely. Uh, especially now we're getting the meat of the prep. You know, and these next four practices are, are real game plan situations. So a little bit of trial and error. We'll see what looks good out of practice. I think personnel is a critical part. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, you have to keep in mind when when Kevin Claxton's out there instead of Nickel, uh, it's a different person out there in space. You know, so you gotta uh, kind of keep that tempered and in mind. So it, it definitely is. And the other thing is, Oregon. Once you're within a series, you kind of have to stay with what you got. There isn't uh, much of a chance to sub uh, and, and get guys in there in the game. And you got an ACC crew, which to me might be one of the biggest storylines of the whole game. Uh, you're not a Big Ten officiating crew. You're not a Pac-10 officiating crew. It's an ACC crew. Uh, and obviously they're not well versed in, in, in officiating Oregon themselves, so it's it's going to be a very neat challenge for them as well. Along, along those lines, I assume, how, how early before the game do you talk about if Oregon subs last? Don't forget, we, we have get the chance, yeah. There is uh, uh, several occasions on film. Um, uh, and all I can do is go through Bill Carollo, our, our Big Ten, and then he makes communications with, with and he's done an outstanding job of that already. And he's, he, he really uh, was positive about the crew that we were going to be getting. He knew that the, the white hat, he knew him personally, and says he's an excellent official. So um, I thought you might bite on that storyline uh, <laughs> issue. Um, but what we've done, what I have done, is I proactively sent clips that I've seen on film. It just concerns me. Um, well, what, well, how, how's this going to be explained and interpreted? Uh, you'll see clips where you know, basically the umpire stands over the ball and he waits for the official to give him a signal that we're ready for play. And then he has to turn and sprint out of there. And the, the, the Oregon center will snap the ball immediately. There are so many plays where the umpire has his back to the ball and the ball is snapped. So he's looking at the safeties. And he's not even looking where he's supposed to be. I mean, that's his, that's his area. So you, you could have the possibility of false starts by us or them that will never be seen. Um, holdings that will never be seen. Um, again, penalties by us that will never be seen because they aren't physically in a position to see the game. Brent, Brent how, how impressive is their trigger man, the quarterback? Very impressive. Uh, I, I've been uh, uh, not surprised, but he's very accurate, uh, very quick in his decision making. You can see whatever, I'm not even going to try to interpret how they read those signs over there and what they get going, um, but their system and what he goes to, he runs it very, very well. And, and has a lot of confidence in it. You can see when a play doesn't work, he, he, he almost can tell by his reaction he knows why it didn't work uh, and, and, and can try to make those adjustments on the field.